the only God, uh, welcome everyone. I appreciate you guys all joining us today. It's a beautiful day here on the Cherokee Reservation, and uh, we have a great presentation lined up for you today. Vince Fielding is going to present on, um, you know, the culinary tradition of the hog fry, and we're really excited. Well, do for being here today, Vince. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, Abraham. Thanks so, for being here. Yeah, so, you know, Vince was talking yesterday about some of these traditions and how they're, you know, less and less people know about some of these traditions. And, you know, he talked about opening that bottleneck back up to where, you know, we get um, to teach people about more of these things. So really excited that Vince was able to take time, you know, to do this presentation. This is always something that I've wanted to learn more about. Um, you know, my uncles, they always did hog fries and, you know, kind of born out of necessity. Like, how do you feed a hundred people in the middle of the woods sometimes, you know, but um, just um, want to say again, you know, what events, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. All right. Well, um, I tell you what, what we usually do around Cherokee country is we like to include God. So we're going to take a, a, a moment to thank him for the day and thank him for allowing us the opportunity to do this. So uh, if you would, our Heavenly Father, as we come to you in prayer, we thank you for the day that you've given us, and we thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. And Father, as we come to you in prayer, we ask Lord, that you just be with this presentation, bless everybody that's here, be with the Cherokee Nation, be with our reservation, and we thank you, Lord, for everything. Give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray and do. Amen. Yeah, me and Abraham were talking yesterday, and um, even though there's a, there's still quite a few uh, hog meat cookers out there. People can find um, maybe there's like different families that still cook. Um, when you think about it from now and go back about 20 years ago to all the elders and the ones that have passed on, it's starting to form like a V, like a bottleneck. That's what he said. Um, there's not that many people compared to 10, 20 years ago that still cook it. And this is one thing that um, I took up about 25 years ago. I, I believe it's probably going to be about 26 years ago. I was in high school when I first started doing this. And um, one thing I am is I'm, I'm proud to be Cherokee. And it's, it's always good to share what I know. Uh, just to uh, kind of preface this, this is not going to be a, a cooking class by any means. This is just going to be talking uh, talking a little bit about the hog fry and its place in culture. So for the first thing that I want to talk about is the Cherokee Nation itself, the Cherokee people, has they've had a, a vast impact on society as a whole, not necessarily America, but the world. Whenever you think about things, Cherokee Nation, the Cherokee people had a democratic society, a society that was based on democratic principles long before America was founded. And even look at our games, our games that we have, for instance, stickball, the way stickball was originally played, um, pretty much anything with a, a middle line and, and um, in, played on a field with uh, two opposing goals, two opposing posts. Uh, just think about any of the field games that we have today. Look at it. You got basketball, football, soccer, lacrosse, hockey, anything like that. Uh, I say um, kind of uh, has its origins in, in, in not just our, our culture, but, you know, Native American culture. Because we weren't the only ones that played stickball. But if you, if you like to think of it that way, uh, I do. I like to think of it. I, I like to think of it that way. I mean, Cherokees are just awesome. Cherokees are cool. And, um, but whenever it comes to hog fries, I have to say this, a hog fry, even though it is part of our culture uh, now, part of our traditions now, it hasn't always been there. Um, frying food originated, some people say in Egypt, ancient Egypt, and pigs were actually brought over by, uh, some people say DeSoto, the Spanish explorers. But I like to picture it as this, even though those Spaniards were actually eating pork and they saw that it was delicious, it was the Cherokees that had to come 
put it in grease, fry it, and find out that it was 20 times better. So it's always the Cherokees that are in history that are always improving stuff and, and doing things like that. But over the years, the Cherokee people have adapted. Um, they adapted, uh, as I said, even though the hog fries are, are not, um, were not inherently a part of our culture at one time, they are now. And, and you can still see them in, in the Cherokee culture. Now let's begin with what is a hog fry for those of you that do not know. Well, a hog fry is, is pretty much, it's not just a meal. It's not just a meal that's important in here. It's, it's the camaraderie, the gathering, the social aspect that goes into a hog fry. So anytime anybody around here in, in the Cherokee Nation, anybody that has a hog fry, uh, they could usually expect uh, a lot of people to turn up because everybody around here just loves hog. Uh, not only that, but they love uh, fry bread, beans, and uh, fried potatoes. Uh, these are all staples along with uh, the different dishes that everybody may bring. But yeah, these are all staples that can be seen at a hog fry. Food has always been a, a, a part of Cherokee culture. It's always been a very important part of Cherokee culture. Many of the activities that we still continue to do seem to revolve around food or sharing meals or spending time with each other. Uh, the Cherokee people are a, a communal people. Very, very important is community in the Cherokee culture. There's just something about harmony in a group, in a group setting where, where people not only share food, but they also share uh, stories, traditions, and even talents. A lot of times when you go to hog fries and there's a big social gathering, uh, there may be traditional games that are played. Um, there might be even um, traditional stories being told. And uh, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later. But uh, most times at a hog fry, as far as sharing of talents, there's usually a, a gospel singing that can be found around here. Um, the sense of community of the Cherokee people, unfortunately, in, in the past, has also come under attack by many things. Uh, there's, uh, we're not going to get too deep into the, the history of it. But uh, one of the things that I look at is the Dawes Rules of 1887, um, the Dawes Act. Um, pretty much what it did was, um, it, it, the purpose of it really was to break apart the communal structure of tribes across America. It, it really was. And that was one thing that it did uh, was to break up the tribes as a social unit. It attempted to do that. Um, I know that families uh, during this time were split apart because of the uh, allotments that they were given. Maybe one part of the family had uh, land in one particular area and the other part of the family had uh, land that was given to them, allotted to them in another area. And sometimes there were miles and miles in between them. But um, even though these families were split apart, one thing that has reigned true in Cherokee culture is the fact that we still like to get together. And whenever these families got together, and mind you that these families, a lot of them are um, large families. Uh, for instance, my dad, his family, he was one of nine growing up. And I'm sure that there's a lot of families like that in uh, all, all around the Cherokee Nation. But whenever a family came to visit, um, it was always a big deal. It was a big deal. It just, it didn't happen every day. And as Abraham said, it came out of uh, necessity. You know, how do we feed these people? So that is where the hog fry came to be. So as I said, hog fries are social gatherings. Uh, they're very important to community. And um, I'm going to go ahead and show a few pictures here and just kind of talk about uh, the hog fry itself. Now, I've been cooking hog for about 25 years, and 
I'm no means um, a pro at it. I still learn every single time I cook. And I still learn from other people whenever I go visit other hog fries and I talk to their cooks and just having a, having a good time while the meat's cooking. Um, you learn, you learn, you pick up small things here and there. Sometimes you pick up big things that will make things easier for you. But you always have to approach anything with a learning mindset. What can I learn from this? And how can I use this? So let me just go ahead and um, share a few pictures here. So this is a picture of me. This is one of my favorite pictures of me. This was uh, probably about maybe six years and about a hundred pounds ago. Uh, this was uh, at one of my um, dad's hog fries. Uh, back before my dad passed, uh, we uh, had hog fries for his birthday. I started doing this probably uh, about 20 years ago for my dad. And we still do it, even though he's been gone for uh, almost three years. We still do it. We still do it. Now, one thing that you have to do for pretty much any cast iron is you have to season it. Now, seasoning is the actual act of taking um, grease or lard, as you can see in this picture on the left, taking it, putting a thin coat, or you're supposed to put a thin coat. It looks like I put a whole bucket in each one of these. But you take a thin coat, and then you burn these pots. You're pretty much burning this down, and it's going to be black. It's going to be shiny. But what that does is over time, it builds up. These layers and layers build up just like a cast iron pan on your stove. These things are the same, they're just bigger. So you have to just keep on burning these, cooking it, burning these. And one thing that this does as well is whenever you season these, I usually do this the night before, it also um, acts as um, cleaning it as well. You know, it, um, sterilizes it, I guess you could say, because of the heat. Um, of course, whenever you put them up, you got to make sure that they're clean. And I always put just a little bit of oil on the surface just to make sure there's no rust. But as you can see on the picture on the right, these are, um, uh, this was probably about, maybe about four years ago, I was helping out my uncles. And uh, this was at a church in Salina. And I think it was uh, Pastor Appreciation Day. And I want to say that we boiled about 100 pounds and we cooked about 100 pounds. So this is, uh, this is what they look like all lined up here. Pretty sight, if you ask me. This is uh, one of my favorite pictures. Uh, my dad, that's his head that you see, the back of his head. That's also my uncle, Thomas, up there. And these are my cousins. And uh, cutting meat. Now, there's really no particular cut of meat that... Um, I use. Um, back in the day, we did have to help butcher hogs, and that was some hard work that, uh, honestly, I do not miss. I don't miss getting up at the crack of dawn. I don't miss hanging that hog up, scolding it, scraping it, cutting up. I don't, I don't miss any of that. It's, um, I, I miss some of the times that we had doing it, and I miss the people and, and, and the memories that we made. Uh, but uh, the actual physical work of that, I don't, I don't miss it. But there are still some people that do that, and my hat is off to them. But for the most part, we just use uh, Boston butt pork roast. Uh, it can either be boneless or have a bone in, anything that you can uh, go down and, and, and pick up at your local supermarket. That's usually what we use. There's no special type of meat that we use. But here... This was uh, for one of my dad's birthdays, and this was the night before. We were just cutting it up, and what you got to do is you just kind of cut it up into uh, cubes, cubes, uh, maybe about two-inch cubes, and it doesn't have to be exact, but the reason you cut it up is because it cooks evenly uh, instead of just throwing, you know, the whole roast in there. Uh, you just, uh, it just cooks evenly. And uh, once we're ready, uh, I cook with wood. Now, I know there's a lot of people out there out of necessity as well that cook with uh, propane, but I, I'm kind of leery of making that uh, jump just yet. Uh, maybe as I get older, uh, maybe I will because it's, uh, it's very convenient. I can see 
the pros, but um, to me, I cook with fire. I like to cook with wood. It's just the way that I learned. It's uh, difficult to learn, but um, it's just the way that I learned and it's just the way that I do things. Uh, on the right here, uh, that is uh, my hog meat pot. Um, that thing can hold about the most that I've cooked in it. And um, I'm not really comfortable cooking that much in it, but I, I did it. I helped a friend out one time and he needed 125 pounds. So we put 125 pounds in there and it came out probably about uh, maybe three inches from the top. And um, we just uh, we just went for it. And um, that thing could fill, uh, fill a lot of ice chests with, uh, with meat. And on the left, uh, beans. We usually put the beans on about the same time as we do the hog because it usually takes about the same time to cook, depending on if you soak the beans or not. But um, those are those are just tips and tricks that uh, that people have to have to learn on their own. Uh, the first time that I actually cooked meat, uh, it was for my aunt. It was for her birthday, and uh, honestly, I I just about scorched it. I just about ruined the whole sixty pounds that she bought. I did not know what I was doing. Um, I had a general idea of how it was going to be done, watching my uncles and and watching everybody at, at church, uh, but actually doing it. Uh, yeah, there was a, a large learning curve. And, um, and as I said, I'm still learning. I'm still learning. But um, come a long way from that first pot. Um, but they still ate it. They still ate it, even though uh, some of it might have uh, had a little bit of a scorched flavor. Uh, they still ate it. Uh, some of them actually, <laughs> actually did say something about it. But for the most part, everybody was happy that they got hog meat to begin with. <laughs> So um, it, was, uh, it was still a good time. So one thing that I do is right before you put the meat in, I use lard. Lard is the one thing that I use. There's some people that use shortening and there's some people that use a mixture of lard and water. I didn't learn that way. I just learned with lard and there's a certain ratio of lard that you can use to meat, but that's what I learned with. So once you get the lard hot enough, you can put a couple pieces in and it would start to kind of boil, start to fry. That is when you know your grease is hot enough. I don't use thermometers. I don't use any temperature gauges whatsoever. I just go by sight and sound. And a lot of this cooking, uh, you can do that. You can just go by sight and sound. As soon as you put the meat in, it's going to want to turn white. Uh, it's not really appetizing right now, but it's going to want to turn rot white. And the reason is, is because it's got a lot of water in it. It's got a lot of water in it, and that's water's got to cook out before the meat actually starts frying. So depending on how much you're going to cook, um, maybe it could, it could range from uh, two to sometimes even three, three and a half hours, depending on uh, how much, how many pounds you're cooking at one time. Uh, so the time varies, the time varies. But um, this is the beginning of it. And as time goes on, this is uh, probably one of, the, uh, one of the parts that I really cherish the most is once, it, once the meat is on and it starts to cook, um, if you have everything lined up and ready to go, you can just kind of chill. It's, it's a time to just talk. It's a time to tell jokes. It's a time for just, just to be social. Um, all you got to do is just keep an eye on it, stir it a couple times, and um, just keep in mind that you do not want to rush it. Every time that I try to rush something, it usually doesn't turn out, the end product isn't the, the, the consistency or the, the way that I really want it to turn out. So uh, this is one thing that you can't rush. So you just got to chill, just got to kick back and enjoy the times with your family or your friends that are there. On the left here is one of my mentors. It's not the only one, it's, it's one of my mentors. This is Jim Squirrel. He's kind of legendary um, around here in Cherokee country. Uh, he, um, a lot of what I learned, um, a lot of the fundamentals I learned came from him. And I always give him props every time that I'm cooking hog or, or talking about hog fries, 
I always try to give my mentors props. And this is one of them. Jim Squirrel is a big one. Uh, my uncles, uh, Thomas and Jess, uh, they're big ones as well. Um, pictures of uh, me and my cousin actually stirring the pot. Uh, see, I just want to talk about that stick that I'm stirring the pot with. Also the stick that my cousin is stirring the pot with. Uh, my dad actually made that stick for me when I first started cooking hog. And that was 25 years ago. And that stick is 25 years old. Use it every single time we cook hog, we cook beans, always have that stick. And the thing about it is it's, it's pretty well preserved because of the many times it's been dipped in that grease, dipped in that hog grease and it's, it's preserved to, to some point, it's waterproof. And uh, well, 25 years really, um, it's, it's a long time to have something like that around just a tool like, like that to, to be around. But honestly, in the grand scheme of things, I know families that are still using sticks that their grandpas made uh, that are reaching 70, 75, 80 years old, and they're still using them and they're still good today. So this is, this is one thing that I'm proud of. My dad made me this stick and uh, I, I take care of it um, just like I take care of all my pots. I, I really do take care of it because this is uh, one thing that was uh, passed down to me. And maybe I can pass this down to somebody, who knows. But um, you just gotta watch that meat. You just gotta watch it and you just gotta chill. And these are the times whenever the stories come out, uh, the traditions come out. Um, you never know what you're going to hear at a hog fry whenever uh, people are just kind of cooking the hog. It's actually a fun time. It really is. It doesn't matter if you're with your family or you're at a church or you're, or you're cooking for somebody. Uh, there's, there's always a good time to be had when the meat is actually cooking. So that goes back to the social, uh, the social aspect of a hog fry and how important it is to Cherokee people. And this is a, a picture of one of the finished products. Um, I remember growing up that uh, we'd go to churches, they would have uh, meetings every three months, they call them quarterly meetings. And most times they would have somebody cook hog for them. And there were some people there that, um, that would cook the hog. And I wouldn't even have to know who cooked the hog. I could taste it. And uh, this goes for anybody that was there. You could taste it and you could, you would know who cooked the hog? It's just by the taste. It was just the style that they cooked it. The end product, you would know. Woody Hare was one of those people. Jim Squirrel was one of those people. You know, my uncles are you know, some of those people. It's, it, it's crazy, but every hog fryer is different. There's no right or wrong way. Everybody learns different, but it's still a part of the culture and it's still important in our culture. So I haven't really got to the point where I am um, uh, very happy um, with the meat. It's, it's always, I, I want it to be uh, a certain way and I got that in my mind, but I'm, I'm getting there. Every single time that I cook and every single time that I learn something, I'm getting closer to the, the end product and the, and the quality uh, that I personally want it to be, but uh, in the end, uh, it's great. It's great. You, uh, you have this, put a little salt in it. Uh, you're good to go. You are good to go. So this is a finished, finished product. So we also cook um, at a hog fry. It's not just meat. We also cook uh, beans. As you can see on the left there, uh, my family likes to put ham hocks in it. Really adds a lot of flavor depth of flavor really takes it up to the next level. We also cook fry bread and uh, potatoes. Yeah, we do that. So those are the those are the four main things that my family does is your your meat, your beans, your bread, and your potatoes. And uh, on that alone, I mean, anybody can get filled. You know? But, uh, you know, whoever brings like a, a dessert or something, it's always welcome. And this is the uh, end product. This is what... Uh, a plate looks like. And um, for those of you who are uh, watching us and uh, joining us, uh, it's 1130 right now. It could be 1230 where you are. Um, unfortunately, I don't have samples, 
but uh, maybe one of these days uh, you can be able to come to one of my hog fries and uh, we could actually, you know, uh, partake together. But this is what it looks like. I'm still trying to figure out how I can get Pepsi to send me a check for the advertisement here, but uh, it hasn't happened yet. But this is, um, this is a finished plate. And frying hog is something that I really, really do enjoy. And it's a lot of hard work. A lot of people don't realize how much hard work really, really goes into cooking hog. I've actually um, had people ask me, can you, can you teach me how to cook hog? And I said, well, I'll, I'll show you a few things. And um, they've been around one time. And after they see uh, the amount of work that it takes to actually cook meat uh, the way that I've learned, uh, you, you never see them again. But um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of hard work, but uh, I enjoy doing it. And I know that my, my grandpa enjoyed doing it. My, my uncles enjoy doing it. But uh, most of the reasons why that we enjoy doing it is because of the communal aspect, the, the friendships that we've made, uh, the people that we've met, uh, just the social gathering of it. You just can't put a price tag on those things. Memories that you make during those times, great. I look back and, and a lot of the people that have gone on, you know, those, those memories are still there. And a lot of those memories came from a hog fry, came from either cooking the hog or actually just eating it. You know, it's just, um, it's a matter of life that we actually have to, you know, we actually have to pass on, but, you know, we have these, um, these ways that we could still get together. And Cherokee people like to get together. Food has always played an important part in getting together, and uh, it it will continue to do so. It will. So that is pretty much my presentation. As I said, it wasn't going to be a cooking video by any chance, uh, but um, I hope that uh, I shed some light on what exactly a hog fry is and why it was important, and you know, important today. In Cherokee culture. I'm going to leave you with this. Uh, and I tried to find the Facebook post yesterday before I left work here. But I do remember that uh, back in 2017, a tornado hit uh, the community of Greasy and did some damage to uh, their community building. And one of the elders uh, requested uh, some volunteers to go and fetch one thing out of the rubble as they were searching for they they really made a, a search for this and the one thing that he wanted them to search for was the community hog fry pot and he said as long and i'm paraphrasing unfortunately i can't you know find the uh, the actual post when i first saw it but he said something along the lines of as long as we have that we can rebuild so I say this, as long as Cherokees have people to cook their hog, I think we're going to be okay. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Abraham. Hello, Vince. That was a great presentation. Um, I really appreciate that. We do have a question here um, that I want to get to, and I want to invite um, our other um Attendees, if you guys have questions, go ahead and throw them in the Q&A or throw them in the chat room um, really quick. If you guys have questions about the hog fry or, or anything related to it, uh, you know, Vince um, has no problem answering those. So the first question we have is, where can I purchase those pots? I hear that question a lot. Well, you can actually find pots like these on the internet. I don't, I can't attest to the quality of them, but the pots that I use they're really old. The large pot that I have that I cook my hog meat in uh, came from North Carolina. And um, there are ways that you can date it going by the date marks on the pot. And the, there's certain things you look for uh, on, on the way the pot was made. Uh, but it's probably about 70 years old. I think all my pots, I think the newest pot that I have is probably about 40 years old. Um, but I have seen some um, pots out there uh, I've actually seen, you can actually order them on Amazon, different sizes. 
but as I said, I can't attest to the quality of those pots. Um, but yeah, they're, they're still out there. They're still readily available. Absolutely. What do Vince? What do Darren um, for that question? I appreciate that. Good to hear from you. Um, and we have another question here. Do you teach ladies? Would you question mark? I ask because I have only ever seen gentlemen doing it. Um, and so she goes on to say a little bit more, but um, yeah, is there a reason I couldn't learn? No, there's no reason that you couldn't learn. My grandma was always out there. She was always stirring the pot. Uh, my mom, whenever she comes out there, she likes to stir the pot. Um, the pot of hog meat. Okay, let's, let's just keep it that way. Um, my, my grandma and my mom always like to stir, you know, the pot, you know, in a different sense, but uh, the pot of hog meat. You know, but no, there's no reason why um, a woman can't learn how to do this. It's it, it's you have to want to learn how to do this. That's one thing. And uh, I have to say that it is a lot of hard work. It really is. But there's there's no reason why a woman can't do this. Absolutely not. All right. Well, no for that question. I appreciate that. And then from Caitlin, she asks, are there any seasonings added to the hog meat? There are some people that like to add seasonings. And, and as I said, there's, there's no right or wrong way to cook your hog. Many people learn differently, but the only seasoning that I use is salt. That's pretty much the only one that I use. I, I do know some people that put uh, Montreal seasoning in their hog. It's, it's a decent product, but for me, I learned how to cook with salt. And that's pretty much all that I season with is pretty much, I just use salt and lard whenever I'm cooking my meat. All right. Well, no, Caitlin, for that question. Uh, from Richard, he asks, Abraham and Vince, you mentioned at the beginning, you thought there was a bottleneck in terms of the prevalence of hog fries. What can folks and Cherokee Nation do to help correct that? Well, I'll let Abraham tag team this with me, but um, we just have to have, uh, some people out there that actually want to learn, you know, just, um, I don't know how we would create a desire to learn. Um, I know that uh, there's, a, there's still a lot of people out there that cook hog, but as I said, there's, the, uh, compared to 15, 20 years ago, that number has gone down, but, there, you know, there's still quite a few people out there that still do this art, you know, but um, what do you think, Abraham? Yeah, you know, I totally agree, and also, I would encourage people when they see these kind of things going on, not just hog fry, but, you know, maybe stick ball or, or ceremonial things is take that healthy risk and go introduce yourself and ask some questions. You know, one thing I found amongst Cherokees is they're always willing to, you know, share a story with you, share a laugh with you, share their food and share their knowledge. You know, um, I've never um, once been turned down whenever I've asked an elder or asked somebody in the community, you know, to learn about something. But you're totally right. You know, um, it does take, you know, um, the, the part of me that, you know, has been raised in American, you know, in mainstream society. I want to know it. I want to learn it right now. But, you know, um, you know, moving back to Oklahoma and living here, you know, in Telequa, you know, you come to realize nothing is done quickly, like nothing at all. Like you go to the grocery store, you're going to be there a while why everybody in that line tells stories and everything else. So it's just, just like that, you know, in Cherokee culture, all good things, you know, take time and they take patience. And so, you know, if you are really interested in doing any of these things, uh, Vince is totally right that, you know, you just have to be prepared to set aside that time and do it the right way. So. That's right. I'm glad you said that Abraham, because a lot of the things that I learned from my mentors and, and just going from church to church during the quarterly meetings and just kind of being around the pots and uh, just asking a few simple questions could just uh, open the doors to a lot of information that uh, you, you wouldn't learn elsewhere. Um, people are always uh, really willing to share their knowledge with you, uh, but they're willing to share it in just uh, small chunks and you just build on that and continue to build on that as you continue to learn. So yeah, yeah, the elders that I learned from, they were willing to tell me when to stir the meat, uh, how much um, wood to put on the fire, uh, when to bring the fires down, and so on. They they were willing to teach me that, and that's something that uh, 
I cherish to this day. And, and it's still like that. It really is. It's still like that. All right. With old Vince. From Sarah, she asks, what is the volume of your pot? Number of gallons or quarts? Um, I've never really measured measured it. Um, there are numbers on the bottom. Um, the pot that I use to cook all of my meat in is a 30. However, I got numerous pots. I got a couple of 30s and they're different dimensions. So I've never really measured uh, how many gallons, but they're, um, they're, they're just, they're, they vary. They vary from manufacturer to manufacturer, I guess. I know that some pots, I got a couple 15s, some 30s, and I got a 12. I, uh, one of the 12s looks to be about the same amount as a 15. But as far as uh, how many gallons and such, uh, I would estimate maybe, maybe 35 gallons. Estimation. Right, Wado. And so um, I think that's all of our questions right now. But, you know, what would you say to somebody who, you know, maybe lives at large, you know, they just want to get started, um, you know, maybe they're going to buy some pots and, you know, just try and do some of this on their own. You know, I know it's a, a little harder, you know, here in Oklahoma, you go to the grocery store and you tell them the guy, you know, at the meat counter, hey, I need 50 pounds of hog meat. And like they already know they cut it up for you. Like, it's the whole thing. You can't do that outside of, you know, this area. You know, if you go say that in any other grocery store, you know, say, hey, I need hog fry meat, you know, they might look at you a little crazy. So, you know, for some of the people who, when they have their gather gatherings, because, you know, you're totally right, Vince. I was taught the same thing about there's power, you know, when we come together to fellowship and laugh and tell stories and any of that. You know, my uncle always taught me, you know, at the stomp ground, that part was just as important as everything else. You know, just as important as the dance is us laughing together. So, you know, for somebody at large who wants to get this tradition started in their community, what advice do you have for them? I would say start small. Start small. Find you a small pot, maybe like a small bean pot, a Dutch oven. Uh, get familiar with how the cast iron works, because if you've never used cast iron before, it's... Uh, it's 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 different. It's a different animal. So I would say just start small, maybe with uh, 10 pounds, five pounds of meat, chunk it up, put a little bit of lard in there and uh, just kind of go with it. Start small, but uh, a lot of it is uh, trial and error. It really is. It really is trial and error. And, and I know that some of the at large, um, I know in California, uh, if you go, uh, get in touch with somebody at large in California, they actually do hog fries out there. I know the West family up in the northern part of the California uh, still do this. And uh, I know that there's some around uh, Bakersfield that do this. Don't know the names right off, but um, yeah, there's, there's people out there. But I would say just start small, uh, learn how to cook in cast iron, and just go from there. It's, it's trial and error, but uh, if you really want to learn how to do it, um, you just got to, you just got to do it. You just got to take the initiative to actually learn. And it's, it's not that difficult, but there is work involved once you get into, you know, 50 pounds, 80 pounds, and so on. And the main thing is to start small and, and learn how to cook with cast iron. All right, Wado, Wado for your words, Vince. I really appreciate that. Um, so Sarah's talking a little bit about in the chat. Um, she has over 18 pieces of cast iron and prefers cooking that way. Um, you know, she, she's confident that she can, uh, you know, get the equipment and the right hog, but she hasn't had hog fry in decades. She says, what do Vince? So that's going to be, um, it for our presentation today. You know, I would just definitely encourage with any of this stuff. You just got to, sometimes you got to, you know, like Ben said, get you a pot and you may have to burn a couple batches, but yeah. you know, if you, uh, you know, burn some small batches, um, you know, that's probably better than, you know, than burning a hundred pounds of hog meat. But, uh, you know, I'm actually in the same boat as you guys. I've never done a hog fry. I've seen them done my entire life. They're done here in Tahlequah, you know, probably once a week, anywhere, at least you can find somebody cooking hog meat. Um, I actually brought a salad today and I really wish I had a plate of hog meat now because my stomach's growling. 
Um, you know, but yeah, you know, if you guys have any questions also, feel free to reach out to Vince and I. Um, you know, you can email us at any time with, with your questions. And once again, I just really appreciate you putting on this presentation, Vince. Um, I definitely learned a lot. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad that everybody, I see a bunch of names in here that I haven't seen in a long time. Uh, you know, all the travel times that we had pre-COVID, man, it's good to see all of y'all. I even see some family in here as well. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being in here. Uh, it's, it's just been, it's been a great time. Um, it's, uh, you know, I think we'll eventually get back to um, some sense of uh, normalcy, but unfortunately, it's probably it's probably not going to be like it was uh, before COVID. But uh, uh, I'm sure that we will all eventually see each other. So just uh, be safe out there, and uh, thank you all for attending, and, and thank you, Abraham, for allowing me to uh, the opportunity to do this for you all. How long? I hope you all have a great day, and um, hopefully, we will all be eating hog meat together sometime soon. Have a good day. Don't go, honey.